Okay, good morning. And thank you for this chance. Thanks the organizers for this chance to help celebrate uh, GLURAL's 50th. While we've heard a lot about the history of all the great science that's happened at GLURAL over the past 50 years, I'm gonna talk about a program that's just five years old. So this is the Sigler GLURAL Omics program. And so I hope to highlight some of the success stories that we've had in these five years and hopefully illustrate um, some of the insights as well as some of the opportunities that these this technology omics uh, has for Great Lakes research. Whoops, I succeeded in skipping a slide already. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about approaches like genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. So these are all approaches for assessing the composition of molecules in a sample of water. And the idea is that these molecules provide an incredible amount of information about the organisms that are present in a water sample, uh, how those organisms are interacting with their environment. For example, how are they, um, what stressors are they experiencing? And then for certain organisms like harmful algal blooms, what toxins are those organisms producing? And there are a couple of ways that we can approach this. In many cases, we're collecting whole microorganisms on filters and we're extracting these macromolecules and, and sequencing those macromolecules. In other cases, we have materials that are being sloughed off of animals. So imagine we have a mussel or a fish, it's sloughing off uh, skin or scales or damaged tissue or metabolic waste or, or free molecules. And so those molecules are a sign that that organism has been in that parcel of water, right? So that water is packed with these macromolecules, which again, provide this incredible information about what organisms are present and what they are doing. And so this is really a new means of studying, monitoring and modeling ecosystems. This is a revolution. DNA sequencing and other omics is a revolution that was spurred on in biomedical space, but it's now being harnessed in environmental science and it has now arrived in the Great Lakes. And to illustrate that here, we have a map on the left of the Western basin of Lake Erie showing samples through time where we've collected omics data. The plot on the top right-hand side of your screen is showing the cumulative number of samples that we've gathered from the Great Lakes. These are publicly available data sets in different varieties, PCR-based or metagenomic-based or metatranscriptomic-based. You can see it's really taken off in the last 10 to 15 years. And if we had data for 2023, 2024, you would see that that curve continues to bend up towards the ceiling. It's really exponential growth of this technology. It's a wave of data that's coming at us. And as I'll talk about later, we're not fully prepared to harness this wave. But it does provide new approaches to some really core GLURAL and, and NOAA and Sigler research. So harmful algal blooms, invasive species, uh, biodiversity. We have a new biodiversity observation network that Casey Godwin spoke about earlier in the week. And we can also look at food web dynamics and fisheries with these tools. So NOAA has recognized the power of these tools and they have uh, defined a strategic plan that has actionable investments to facilitate integration of these omics techniques into NOAA's mission. At a national level, this is led by Kelly Goodwin and uh, at GLURAL, uh, Debbie Lee, Director Debbie Lee has been instrumental in supporting and directing the NOAA omics program at a high level. At the inception of this project, uh, Tom Johengen, Casey Godwin and Hank Vanderplug really set the course, charted the course for NOAA omics and now the program is led by PI Reagan Herrera, who works closely with Sigler PI Rao Chiganti, as well as uh, various faculty from the Sigler Research Consortium. Those are, those are shown here, Vincent Deneff, Melissa Duhame, myself, Anders Kiladal, and others. And of course, there are many staff, students, and postdocs that are involved in this program. So what I'd like to do now is to, to give you a, a couple of just really short vignettes. We're just gonna be scratching the surface here and, and, and looking at a subset of projects, uh, but hopefully trying to illustrate some of the success stories and some of the potential of these methods. And the first example will be about how genes can serve as markers of harmful algal bloom toxins. So in this case, if you look on the left side there, we have these 10 genes, MCY genes that encode the biosynthesis or the construction of this toxin called microcystin, one of the main concerns about drinking water 
quality in the Great Lakes, that, that toxin is shown there below the genes. And so in this project done by Rao Chaganti and colleagues, we have compared the abundance of that gene and at one particular gene, MCYE, to the concentration of the toxin in 554 samples across five years and six stations. And if you have a really good eye, you might be able to see that there's a decent correlation between the blue and the red, that is the gene abundance and the toxin abundance. But what I really wanna highlight is that oftentimes you can see the blue before you can see the red. You can see the genes before you see the toxins. And if we take a closer look, this will hopefully be easier on the eyes now, just boiling that down into line plots, showing when we have detectable and quantifiable genes and when we have detectable toxin, this is for all the years, and then we zoom in to 2009, you see that, yes, we often are able to see the genes several weeks before we see the toxins. And so we think that this is really promising as an early warning of the toxin that's coming. And uh, through modeling, we also hope to take this genetic data and develop better predictions, better forecasts of toxins, which is not possible through remote sensing or biomass-based measurements. For the second little vignette, I'm gonna stick with microcystin and, micro, and, and the organism microcystis and look at how we've actually discovered a new type of microcystin in the lakes. So here, PhD student Colleen Yancey has mapped DNA sequences from Lake Erie onto a known reference set of gene sequences. So again, I, these arrows in the middle represent the known MCY genes that encode the biosynthesis of this toxin, MCYE. If you look at the top here, each one of those little black dots represents an individual DNA sequence that has been mapped to uh, a location on these genes. The, the top plot shows the percent identity, so how closely related is the wild sequence from the known sequence. And this little blue line tallies the number of sequences retrieved at each position. So what can we tell from this? Well, you look and see from the relatively even uh, distribution of sequences that we have captured DNA sequences in the field that match every gene for MCY biosynthesis. So we've captured the complete set of genes encoding the construction of this toxic molecule. In contrast on the bottom in a different sample, we have a very different pattern where we have this dense uh, cloud of sequences only at the MCY, A, B, and C genes. And if you look at the tally, the, the abundance of those sequences, we don't see hardly any sequences for MCY genes D through J. We interpret this as a partial set of genes that is present in the field, okay? So here we have organisms that have just a subset of the genes required for MCY, bio, for microcystin biosynthesis. So why do these organisms have a partial set of genes for biosynthesis of this toxin? Well, again, PhD student Colleen Yancey took what's known about the biochemistry of these genes. We know that each gene is responsible for the assembly of one amino acid, one or two amino acids onto this molecule. It's like an assembly line that puts together this toxin molecule. And knowing the function of these three genes, Colleen predicted that these three genes should produce a truncated version of the toxin, a four amino acid molecule instead of a seven amino acid molecule. And this has um, uh, been confirmed now in cultures and in the field with mass spectrometry. And it's only present when this partial MCY operon is present. So we have a novel genotype that's producing a novel molecule. This is important because that molecule is not detectable by conventional methods. We don't know it's there. Uh, it's also potentially important because our initial assays suggest that this truncated molecule has some toxic properties. So we have an unknown molecule that's potentially harmful to ecosystem and human health that we didn't know about before and we couldn't detect before. So a take home point here is that these omics tools can reveal major surprises that are hiding in plain sight. Another example of how we're identifying emerging toxins is with regard to a different toxin, saxitoxin. This is a potent neurotoxin. It's so strong that it is classified as a chemical warfare agent. So saxitoxin has popped up here and there in the Great Lakes, but we've never known which organisms are producing this molecule. So master student and now Sigler staff member, Paul Denial, 
has been the first to reconstruct the complete set of genes responsible for biosynthesis of saxitoxin. That's shown in the, in the top here, the Great Lakes strain. And when Paul compares these Great Lakes genes to known strains that are known to produce known toxins, he's able to, to see that um, these genes are predicted to produce both saxitoxin and neosaxitoxin. So this toxin comes in different flavors with different structures and different toxicities. And from the genes, we can predict which of those structures are present and, and make predictions about the potential human health threats. Uh, what Paul has also been able to do here is to reconstruct the complete genomes that harbor these genes. And so through, through this, he's able to assign this capability of producing saxitoxin to a specific organism, Dolichospermum. It seems to be produced by Dolichospermum in every case when we can detect these genes across the Great Lakes. So here's another example of how the genes can tell us what toxins can be produced and which toxins are producing them. Another major goal of the NOAA, uh, NOAA Glural Sigler Omics program is to link genetic and phenotypic traits in order to inform harmful algal bloom models. And so what I've just told you all about is essentially one trait, the ability to produce a toxin. But these cyanobacteria have thousands of genes encoding thousands of traits. So encoding various toxins, but also encoding everything else about how these organisms live, how they acquire nutrients, how they interact with other organisms, how they move, how they live how they die. And so these traits are really important for understanding the development and dynamics and demise of harmful algal blooms. And in this example, we're looking at the diversity of different microcystis strains. So there's many different versions of microcystis out there. And each one of these strains has a different set of genes encoding these different traits for toxin biosynthesis, nutrient uptake, etc. So we feel that by understanding these traits, we can better parameterize models. We can make more, hopefully make more accurate predictions about harmful algal blooms. And then we can track these genes in the field to understand and evaluate the output of these models. And you'll hear more about this, I think, in the next talk by Vincent Deneff. We're also very much interested in coupling these omics technologies to autonomous sampling capabilities. You heard about this a bit from uh, Debbie and from uh, Reagan Herrera yesterday. So here the motivation is that with humans and boats, we can be out there in the field maybe once or twice or a few times a week. Uh, but with these autonomous vehicles, we can be out there 24 seven and capturing dynamics that occur on daily or even hourly timescales. And so this has been a collaboration with NCOS and Mbari and using these uh, ESPs that stands for environmental sample processors that are able to continuously sample and provide near real-time data on toxins. They're also able to archive samples, so they preserve DNA and RNA, so we can analyze that once we get back to the laboratory uh, to the tune of about 42 to 60 samples per deployment, depending on whether, whether we're talking about the second generation or third generation environmental sample processor. And as Reagan mentioned yesterday, this third generation environmental sample processor is also now being outfitted into the C-Track, which is a surface vehicle, which allows us to get into shallow areas, which are real hot spots for human interactions with these harmful algal blooms. So we're really excited about um, the information that we can get on these uh, continuous monitoring measurements. And it's been now demonstrated in field trials. Okay, so that's a lot about harmful algal blooms. We are also working towards using these omics technologies to track communities and ecosystems more broadly. And one of the big questions that we always have if we find a piece of DNA from an organism is was that DNA from an organism that was here five minutes ago or last week, right? How old is that eDNA? And uh, with the lack of time here, I'll just draw your attention to the right side of this uh, slide where postdoc Nate Marshall and Sigler research scientist Rao Chiganti have been working on tools to estimate the age of the eDNA. And in particular, uh, they're looking at the ratio of RNA and DNA in a sample through time. These two molecules have different decay rates and half-lives shown in this uh, schematic diagram right here. So RNA decays quite a bit faster than DNA. 
And so by doing some calibration experiments, we can look at how that ratio translates into the age of an eDNA molecule. And so this, this seems to be an accurate way of looking at the age of the eDNA and getting a sense of how fresh this signal is. So RNA to DNA ratios provide information about how long ago an organism might have been present in a sample. Okay, so to wrap up here, uh, I wanna uh, mention uh, Glamour as, as Debbie introduced it. So we have this wave of data and we are, we are not prepared in terms of human resources, analytical capabilities, or the ability to, to store or disseminate this data. And so to address that, we've been uh, working on building up our omics capacity at Glural and at Sigler, and starting with the development of a database and data portal to synthesize and disseminate omics data. So we've collected all publicly available genetic data in the Great Lakes, and we've synthesized that in one place along with the environmental data. This is work done by now research scientist Andres Kiladal. So the, the data is united in one place. We've processed it with standardized pipelines. And what this allows is to facilitate comparison across data sets. It's also together with the environmental data. This is a real weakness of other public databases. And so that facilitates comparison in the context of the environmental data in which those organisms are living. And the, the last piece here is this web-based interface where you can go in and, and you can imagine a school kid or a, a Viking uh, cruise participant that might punch in their favorite gene or their favorite organism and see the abundance of, of DNA sampled over the last 20 years across the Great Lakes. We hope this will be a great educational tool. And lastly, we're developing the human resources. So Andres Kiladal is leading weekly bioinformatics workshops that involve about 20 people. We are conducting workshops to hopefully build up a community of practice that'll be pushing these techniques forward. And so to conclude, hope I've given you a little bit of a sense of how OMEX approaches are providing new means of addressing core Great Lakes research questions. We're just five years in, but there's already these substantial uh, discoveries and accomplishments. We're moving towards early warning of toxins. We've discovered a new microcystin molecule. We've identified and characterized saxitoxin producing organisms. We've demonstrated autonomous monitoring of HABs and broader animal ecosystem communities. And we've now developed and launched this novel research database for synthesizing omics and environmental data. So happy 50th Glural. We're not just um, celebrating uh, the, the deep accomplishments, but also the emerging areas of research that are gonna carry us into the future here. So with that, thanks for your attention. I'd be happy to answer a question if there's time. Thanks.